Okay, welcome back in. I am going to, to do a video that accompanies 6.3 in the OpenStax textbook. I'm actually going to do two videos. Uh, there's a lot in this section. And so uh, all of this, this section of the textbook refers to the anatomy of a bone, kind of the, the medical terminology or the anatomical terminology that goes along with the macroscopic and the microscopic anatomy of the bone. Uh, there's just a lot in this chapter, and I'm not even going to try to cover all of it in the video. I would like you to look at it all very carefully. Uh, many, much of it corresponds to what you're learning in a lab. Now, what I'm pulling out here are some of the pieces that you won't learn in as much detail in the lab. The lab tends to focus more on gross anatomy. We're going to tend to do a little bit with the microanatomy uh, more in the lecture where I do cover anatomy. But again, 6.3 will probably be two videos. Um, and, and I want you to, to you know, take a look at some of the things I don't cover in the video as it might support you in your study for the lab. All right, so what I'm going to be doing is, is looking at, at the external uh, and internal gross anatomy of the humerus here as an example of a long bone. Um, so any bone you would look at long bone wise would look pretty much like this same thing, whether you're looking at a phalange, a metacarpal, a metatarsal, whether that be a, a, a tibia, a fibia, fibula, um, whether that be the femur, the humerus here, the radius, the ulna, any of the long bones will have the same kind of features. And, you know, if you've done any of the lab already, or maybe you just know this in general, we often refer to the long bones as having a head, which is the, typically the end of the bone, and then a neck, and then a shaft. And that's fine if, it's, if you really are just looking at the gross anatomy of a whole bone uh, with, with no regard to what's on the inside of that bone. But if you begin to dissect the bone and look at the features on the inside, then we use a different set of terminology to recognize the sections of the bone. Okay, so I want you to notice a couple things really quickly. Let's, number one, begin up here. This is the proximal end of the bone. It's the part of the humerus that articulates in the shoulder. And then down here, we have the distal end of the bone. Remembering that proximal, closer to the midline, distal, farther away. The distal part here articulates with the radius and the ulna. And this is, of course, part of the elbow here. Anyway, I want you to notice that the ends of this bone are covered with an articulating cartilage, referred to as articular cartilage and articular cartilage. Now, the articular cartilage is you're going to learn more about how that gets there uh, in a later lecture that corresponds once we get to 6.4. So I'm going to hold off on that right now. I just want you to notice that they're there. Uh, that provides a kind of a, a, a glossy surface for the two bones uh, that are articulating with one another to slide on one another a little easier. It protects and prevents friction. So but we'll talk about that more later. I want to refer to, to the different parts of the bone uh, here uh, that are found over on the, on the left-hand side of this figure. Notice that this, is, this portion from here up, they refer to as the proximal epiphysis. And then if you come down to the distal end, it's the same thing. This is the distal epiphysis. And then notice here, metaphysis above that, metaphysis below that, and then the middle portion of the bone is the diaphysis. Now let's examine why. If you look at this bone carefully, you're going to notice a couple things. First of all, if you come down from the articular cartilage, you'll see this interesting line that separates the epiphysis above from the metaphysis below. And that line is referred to as the epiphyseal line. When the bone is growing in a young uh, child, uh, before they, they've reached their maximum growth, this, ref this line is referred to the, as the epiphyseal plate. More generally, we probably refer to it as the growth plate. This is where a bone gains its length, both in this direction and in that direction. I'll tell you more about that when we get to 6.4 and I talk about bone growth. Um, but I, that is what separates, this epiphyseal line here is what separates the epiphysis above and the metaphysis below. In any event, both of these, the epiphysis and the metaphysis, are filled with a spongy bone and filled with what is referred to as red bone marrow. So spongy bone and red bone marrow. Uh, and the red bone marrow is where you get blood cell production. And I'll have a little bit more to say about that later, but I can hold off on that for right now. Where the metaphysis meets the diaphysis, what happens is the bone becomes completely hollow. And the hollow portion of the bone, that hollowness is referred to as the medullary cavity. 
notice that it's surrounded or ringed by this compact bone. And this compact bone is what actually gives the bone all of its strength. Uh, the fact that it's hollow makes it nice and light, which is nice because you don't, you know, you're not so heavy when you're, you're carrying yourself around. That actually is quite important. Uh, the other thing the medullary cavity does is it provides a place for storage of fat. And so the, the medullary cavity in the diaphysis is filled with yellow bone marrow. So the diaphysis is filled with yellow. The metaphysis and epiph uh, the, epi the epiphysis is filled with red bone marrow. Okay. We're going to talk more about this compact bone and what it looks like internally, you know, sort of microscopically in a moment. We'll do the same for the spongy bone in just a minute. But right now, I want you to focus on two additional things. I want you to focus on the fact that the inside of the bone is lined with something referred to as the end osteum. And the end osteum is a place of growth. That's actually a, a cellular um, uh, lining that provides for growth and remodeling of the bone. And that's found both here, the, the picture shows it as being in the medullary cavity, which is true, but you can also find end osteum up here in the spongy bone as well. And, and we'll hear more about the end osteum in a little bit. The other thing I want to point to is the periosteum. So periosteum and end osteum. End is on the inside, periosteum on the outside, peri on the outside. And the periosteum is also a membrane that completely surrounds the surface of long bones. Uh, and we will, we will talk about that in a little bit more detail in just one moment. But I do want to show you also this blood vessel referred to as the nutrient artery. And this is what's bringing blood into the core of the bone and feeding all of the cells that are part of the bone. And so let's take a quick uh, look at the periosteum on this uh, illustration just to the right. So go to the top right and notice the periosteum is shown in a little bit more detail. The periosteum being that, that uh, the lining on the outside of the bone. It's got two parts. The periosteum first has a fibrous layer, which is made of dense, irregular connective tissue. So you'd expect to find fibroblasts in there, and, and you do. You find fibroblasts in this fibrous layer, laying down all the normal fibers that are associated with dense, irregular. Just underneath that, there is a cellular layer that is referred to as the osteogenic layer. And the osteogenic layer has osteoblasts, which is a kind of, of bone cell which produces new bone. Uh, and here uh, you can find osteoblasts in this picture right here. So they're part of, of the internal por portion, the cellular portion of the periosteum. Talk more about osteoblasts in a minute. Um, if you also, I, I wanted, wanted to show you that once you get into the compact bone here, this is the compact bone it's showing, that you also have these little lacuna. And it, those are the, the kind of spaces within the bone here. And those little, those little hollow spaces are filled with a cell referred to as the osteocyte. So these are osteocytes living in those little lacuna uh, within the bone. And I'm going to have a little bit more to talk about that in a minute because we're going to look at, uh, uh, in the next video, we're going to look very carefully at compact bone and how it's constructed. Before I leave these larger uh, picture, I want, to, I want to talk briefly about the flat bones. Really interesting structure. Notice that it has periosteum surrounding the outside of the bone, just like you'd expect. There's actually end osteum in here. It doesn't show it, but there is. Um, and what I want you to notice is that there's compact bone on the outside, compact bone on the inside. And that actually is a really effective design for a compact bone. The fact that this is filled with spongy bone all the way through and doesn't have that hollow yellow marrow turns out to be really important because... If you, let's say, get struck in the head with something that, that is going to be enough force to break the bone, what happens is it breaks the compact bone on the outside, but then this spongy bone collapses and kind of absorbs some of that uh, impact. And rather than breaking the internal bone, it usually stops the breakage before that internal compact bone is broken. Really important, kind of like a shock absorber. Uh, and that really is, a, a, is a, a great protection for your brain. Now, any flat bone is the same. The same goes for your ribs. The same goes for your sternum. The same goes for your pelvic. Basically, any of the flat bones uh, are the same kind of structure. Okay, the, the last thing I want to do in this video is talk a little bit about some of these, these cells you see up here. What is an osteoclast, for example? What's an osteocyte versus an osteoblast, an osteogenic cell? So we can look at them here and see where they are, but better to, to take a look at them uh, in the following uh, graphic. So 
so very quickly we can take a look at the kinds of cells now I want you to I want you to start here at the bottom of this this figure and look here at the osteogenic cell this is where it all begins osteogenic cells are essentially what we refer to as a bone stem cell uh, the the role of an osteogenic cell is just to go through mitosis and make a bunch of daughter cells who will all end up being osteoblasts now it is the job of these osteoblasts to form the bone matrix that calcium uh, and phosphorus uh, exoskeleton that they they build around themselves this matrix uh, that becomes the hard compact bone or the or even the spongy bone that matrix is formed by the osteoblasts uh, and so it's it's extruded out of the cell and it, and it forms this matrix around it itself once it surrounds itself with this this hard uh, for, bony matrix uh, it basically entraps itself and it traps itself it entraps itself inside of these little lacuna uh, and at that point that osteoblast uh, is referred to as an osteocyte uh, and, it, and its job is to maintain the integrity of the bone uh, and so I'll have more to say about that in a little bit but notice the process osteogenic cells are the stem cells in the bone they produce osteoblasts and the osteoblasts produce the, the calcium uh, exoskeleton around themselves uh, secrete that and then once they've completely entrapped themselves in that matrix they are then referred to as osteocytes okay now there's another player here known as the osteoclast these cells are quite interesting number one notice they have multiple nuclei they are not a remnant or they are not produced by an osteogenic stem cell in fact rather their progenitors are either monocytes or macrophages which are a type of white blood cell uh, so white blood cells in fact are the stem cells that give rise to osteoclasts and the osteoclasts their job is to resorb bone it's basically to take the calcium uh, the calcium product that is extruded out of these cells or secreted out of these cells forming the, the bony matrix and then to break that bony matrix back down that's the the role of an osteoclast so again in section 6.4 we'll learn more about bone growth and bone remodeling and i'll have more to say about them then but i just wanted you to to be introduced to the four kinds of players uh, in the cellular compartment here in the in this table it shows you uh, some of the things we just talked about an osteogenic cell uh, is a stem cell which mitotically uh, produces osteoblasts and then these these daughter cells which become osteoblasts their job is to be in the deep layers of the periosteum and in the uh, where, where they're found I'm sorry these osteogenic cells are found in the periosteum uh, can also be found in, in the endosteum uh, and in the marrow and so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about those in a bit osteoblasts are anywhere where you have bone growing and you're going to find them uh, both in the periosteum and endosteum as well as the uh, epiphyseal plates that we talked about earlier so very important for bone growth osteocytes again once that osteoblast has surrounded itself in the matrix uh, so they they are then responsible for maintaining that mineral concentration of the matrix that surrounds them and where's their location they are entrapped in lacuna uh, and so they're entrapped in lacuna within the matrix Again, osteoclasts, their, their role is bone resorption, and they are not coming from osteogenic cells, but rather from macrophages and monocytes, white blood cells, that is. And they are found on bone surfaces uh, and at the sites of old, injured, and unneeded bone. Anywhere where you're going to pull bone apart. Mostly, they're found along the end osteum. That's the, mo the, the most common place to find them is in the end osteum. Okay, and with that, I'm going to end this uh, video, and we're going to proceed to another video to, to finish 6.3.